Hello and welcome back to the tech department. My name is Jess B and this is my tech department. Today I'm going to be looking at our old friend the Commodore Plus 4. Now when we last saw that machine I had stripped it down and made it ready for a good cleaning. Well today we have to sort out the few remaining issues. Firstly the board needs a recap. Then we have to replace these old broken keys. There are a few. And finally, we have to reassemble it and see if we can actually get the old Commodore Plus 4 back working. So, all that's left to say is, Los Git! Right, let's get started with the recapping, shall we? Emergency. Emergency. Please remain calm. Oh dear. Um, I've hit a little snag. Now then, um, for most YouTubers who do this kind of thing, they have a desoldering station with a desoldering gun that's temperature controlled. I don't. Um, it is now on my list of things to pick up very soon <laughs> because that's where I've hit an issue today. You see, what I use is a solder iron with a built-in desolder pump. It seemed like a brilliant idea and when it works it really is. It has a heated element, you hold it over it and it sucks up the uh, solder when it wants to. Which is great for the positive side of capacitors because the positive side is generally one simple track. For the negative side, where those negative um, leads meet the ground plane, it's a problem. I cannot get enough heat into the board to clear all the solder from the holes. The ground plane is just wicking the heat away from the soldering iron. Instead, I've had to have a workaround. Unfortunately, the Plus 4 is a fairly simple machine and I can work around it. So I've got all fresh caps on the board. Not necessarily in the neatest order, but they are on there. And hopefully there's a little bit of B-roll just to explain what, I, what I've done. Um, and yeah, I will be picking up a new desoldering station very soon because a 20 euro desoldering pump that is an iron and a pump doesn't work. Anyway, back to the fun. So the recapping didn't go according to plan. Nevertheless, we did get the job done and now it's time to actually clean that board and hopefully clean up those disc capacitors. So let's start with a little IPA and uh, hopefully get a brush in there. Yep, there we go. Um, look, this is going to take a while. How about we uh, speed things up a little, eh? Ah, that's much better. Now, this board is a real pain in the neck to try and clean. There are little tiny areas where barely that cotton bud will get in there. But nonetheless, a brush, a cotton bud, and a lot of time, we can get it clean. Ah, time for some gloves. And now turning to these capacitors. No matter what I did, I did manage to get them to clean up a little bit, but unfortunately I could not get all that white stuff off them. Back to the back of the board, and yeah, it's trying to get in all those nuts and crannies, get the uh, data port there covered, and clean off the TED chip as well. And that'll become apparent why we need to do that in a minute. Now the TED chip is known to run hot, and the top of the case acts as a heatsink. It's even got a little bit of copper on it, see? So I'm going to take some of this um, Arctic uh, MX4 thermal compound, pop it on there, and uh, this will help keep things cool. Now, I'm not going to be very precise with this. I'm just going to use my fingertip and uh, spread it out. It's not like I'm running a Pentium processor here. This will just help the TED chip cool off a little. And uh, yeah, Ugh. sticky. Ew. With the thermal paste sorted, all I have to do is pop the top of this back on, which is not as easy as it seems apparently, 
and that uh, little copper tab will contact on top of the TED chip and help keep it cool. So nice going, easy to do, eventually. Go on, ah, go on, go up, there you go, see? And now it's time to get the board back in the new clean case. So, popping it back in, and this is the thing I love about 80s micros, you just have a few screws, it slides back in, and uh, yeah, you're done, it's in there. Now I just have to put the screws in and uh, we can get on with our next job, which is assembling the keyboard. And that's gonna be a more difficult job. Right, the first job we have to do is replace that missing dome keycap from the up arrow. If you remember from the first video, the up key just kind of looked a little soft. Well, it was because there was no cap in there. Then all I have to do is screw the entire back plate back on and there are many screws. Then it's on with putting the keys back on the keyboard and here it's just best to take your time because some of these keys are going to be fiddly, especially the latched ones. All you can do is just be careful, make sure you've got an image of the keyboard and I did because I was very unfamiliar with a few of the key positions on this old machine. And then yeah, just slowly take your time and hope nothing breaks. There's no going away from it, but this is a fiddly job. First, you have to separate up the springs that are in the box, then add the key cap, and then with one last push, push it down until it clicks. It's slow going, it's laborious, especially when you're trying to find where you've left that last key, but slowly and surely, the keyboard starts to resemble its normal self. Before you know it, all we need to do then is put our missing keys on and uh, yeah, those actually prove pretty easy and they're in great condition. They match really, really well and I'm really happy about that. And as our last key goes on, that can only mean one thing. It's time to reassemble the machine and uh, let's see if it's working. Reassembling is fairly simple. First, I have to put in the rather industrial keyboard connector, and I really wish more 8-bit micros had a connector like this. I'm looking at you, ZX Spectrum. I'm looking at you. And then all we have to do is add the case screws back in, and the machine is once again back together and looking okay, if we, even if I do say so myself. With the last screw, it's now time for the big reveal. And I have to say, I am so proud of this one. Is she in the greatest condition of her life? No, but considering how this machine looked when she entered the tech department, I couldn't be happier. Gone are those horrible dirty keys replaced with these wonderful brand spanking new looking examples. There are just one or two keys at the end that may need a little retro writing, but it's so unnoticeable that it doesn't really detract from the machine. Now, the machine, as I say, is not in pristine condition, and unfortunately, there were some stains that just simply wouldn't lift. Nonetheless, for a machine that's over 40 years old near enough, I think it wears its battle scars with pride, and it adds a certain patina to the machine that uh, tells a little bit of a story, I think. Of course, I haven't tested this machine um, and I don't really know if any of the repairs that we've made have actually made a difference. But I'm really hopeful that this keyboard will be back to normal and we may even be able to play the odd game on it. Let's find out. So let's get the machine set up ready for use. Now I'm fortunate I have a Commodore C64 video cable that fits perfectly and will run into the SCART of our old TV. 
Next up, I've been out and I've done a little bit of shopping and I bought a 1531 data cassette that's brand new. And we're gonna use it on this machine. And I'm kind of intrigued because I've never used this. I've only got experience of spectrums. So I don't really know what to expect from using this tape recorder. I expect it'll work the same, but I just don't know. The thing I really love about it, I bought this as new old stock. It's complete in its box, it has the original manual, and it doesn't even look like it's ever been used. So yeah, I'm actually really excited about this. What sets it apart from the ZX Spectrum, of course, is that it draws the power directly from the Commodore Plus 4 itself. Uh, the Spectrum, of course, is just any old tape recorder you can plug in and a set of leads, but this all-in-one solution kind of works. Of course, this only works with the Commodore Plus 4 and uh, C16 model range. For some reason, Commodore decided to make it proprietary, which is ridiculous. So if you had a C64 and wanted to use your data cassette, you needed a converter. Fortunately, I have that. I also have one for the joystick as well, which I'm going to need a little later. Turning on the machine, it springs to life immediately, and I'm really happy to see that the picture looks sharp. Now to load the game, I simply type load, hit enter, and then it tells me to press play on the tape recorder. Interesting. Now, I was surprised to discover I had a C16 stroke plus four game in the tech department. I mostly have Spectrum games on cassette, but for some reason this one seems to have sneaked in and it's called Trailblazer. With load sorted and the uh, cassette running, it's only a matter of time now I hope until the game starts loading. And boy had I forgotten how long 8-bit games take to load. Let's speed that up, shall we? One of the curious things I did find was while it did load the game and it gave me a very familiar looking screen as it did so, there was no actual sound of data being read, which was really nice compared to the Spectrum. No more ee -ee noises. Spectrum users know what I mean, eh? All of a sudden, I'm in the game and it's fantastic. It's awesome. It makes noise and I have no idea what's going on and no clue how to play this. And I think that's represented very well by the fact that the following gameplay is simply terrible. If you're looking to find someone who doesn't know how to play a game, especially this game, look no further. I am here. Let's see. Even finding a joystick on the shelf and using the converter didn't really help my ability to play this game. <laughs> yes, I could control the ball better, but I still fell in a lot of holes. Still, it's actually quite good fun, and um, yeah, I'm going to have to look this up on other platforms. Well, there we have it. The Commodore Plus 4 is back together and looking pretty good if I do say so myself. The keyboard has been cleaned up. It's now working 90% of the time with only just two or three keys that are still a little dodgy that I'll have to take a look at, but I'm sure we can fix it. It's not as pristine as I would like, but that's fine because really this is a 40 year old machine and that patina actually adds to the machine's story. Uh, one of my major problems has been that where the Commodore logo is on top, there's just a little bit of glue that's been used to put it back together and it's spilt over and it's very difficult to remove. But that's fine. Um, one of the cool things I really enjoyed with this machine was getting that data recorder, that 1531 data recorder that's brand new, plugging it in and just seeing it work. And uh, being able to load up Trailblazers, I'm very lucky I had a C16 game here in the tech department, considering I don't actually have a C16. But loading up Trailblazer was really cool and hearing that music was, I mean, that sent me back a little bit. The thing I really, really enjoyed, um, and I have to give a shout out to the person I bought this off, thank you so much for including not only a converter for a Commodore 64 data cassette, 
for this machine, but also the joystick converter. That meant I could just take a joystick off the shelf, plug it in, and not have to worry about the silly nonsense that was the Plus 4's joystick uh, plugs. Didn't help me play Trailblazer any better, but there you go. A huge shout out to Retroleum in the UK, where I managed to source not only the recap kit for this machine, but also the keys that were broken and in excellent condition. You, if you need anything for a machine like this, the Plus 4, the C16, C64, Spectrum, check out Russ and Vitroleum in the UK. I'll leave a link in the description below. It's well worth it and prices are really reasonable, even when I had to import them to Austria. All that's left to say is I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving us a thumbs up. It really helps out. And if you really enjoyed it, do consider subscribing because there are a lot more machines in here that I will be working on in the future. If you'd like to help out the channel in other ways, um, yeah, we have a Patreon um, account. Feel free to drop by. Uh, prices start from, I think, like a euro or a month, something like that. And you get all kinds of benefits, I hope. That said, you don't have to. A, a simple thumbs up uh, helps out immensely. Um, all that's left to say is uh, thanks for watching. And uh, when it comes to old machines, please uh, remember to reconnect, rediscover, and uh, have some fun. Thanks for watching. Cheers.